Hello, everyone. I'm glad that you are tuning into this video. I just wanting to just briefly share with you, I don't like to take up too much time in doing that, but as I have been going through messages and I'm trying to put together all of my old messages and then rewrite things to make them more current in, in things and try to use them and put them together as God would see fit. As we're doing a lot of preaching in this time, we do the video and the church service and lots of things, but honestly this week I was wondering if I would even do a video. I thought maybe we'll just not do a new video with everything that is going on, which I'm certainly not going to bore you with those details either. But I came across this message that I had actually written for Revival quite some time ago. And it's one of the few messages that honestly I never heard another preacher. And I'm sure there's ones out there that have done it. I don't, I don't mean it in that way. But to me it was very, very original because I had never heard another preacher talk about it and bring it into that light. And in my own personal devotional time, the Lord opened this to me. One of the issues that we have in the Warrior Sword Ministry is that we do bunches of ministry, but we basically minister to different groups of people. So we have one group that watches the videos and one group that reads the thought for today and one group that reads the newsletters. And so if I try to say, well, we did this, the group that is doing the other doesn't know about that. And we do have a handful of people that kind of follow everything, but otherwise we're ministering to different groups in different settings. But a while back in the thought for today, not really that long ago, I wrote about hoarding, spiritual hoarding and holding on to things. And that thought went through my mind as I came across this message and I felt like that the Lord was beginning to deal with me in ministering on it. A lot of people won't even recognize the name. The title of the message is Gibeah. And I have laughed through the times when I've talked about Gibeah or written it in church bulletins. People would come up to me and say, how do you say that? What does that mean? What is the meaning of a message Gibeah? And so let's take a look at that. We're going to read from Joshua chapter 24 verses 19 to 20. These verses will probably be more familiar than the name Gibeah. Joshua 24 verses 19 to 20. The nation of Israel has said, we will follow the Lord. We will serve the Lord. We will worship the Lord. And that sounds like what every minister in the country would love to hear. But this was Joshua's response. And Joshua said unto the people, ye cannot serve the Lord, for he is an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he hath done you good. Really, really strange way for a leader to respond to his people after he has just tried to lead them to say, we will serve the Lord. And they say, we will. And then Joshua says, you can't. I know that in recent weeks that I have stirred up lots of things in people talking about sin and all of those kinds of things. And I know that that's a very unpopular topic. In fact, people just ignore the issue of sin. 
We want to have victory in our lives with no sacrifice, with no change, without making any difference whatsoever. We want to just continue to live our lives the way that we live them, accepting everything that we do and say, well, God, we want you to give us victory. We want to serve the Lord, yes. If you go through every church in America and ask people, do you want to serve the Lord? They respond, yes. But they want to serve the Lord and hold on to their idols. The problem a lot of times in modern day is that our idols are much more subtle than what the idols were back in Old Testament times. See, you could tell somebody was worshiping idols in Old Testament time. They built the figures. They, they took gold or silver or precious metals or whatever, and, and they built their idols. Our idols are much more subtle. But they have the same result when you try to hold on to things in your life that God has commanded you to get rid of. So it doesn't matter if you have little statues on your table that you're praying to. Or whether it's things that absolutely consume your time and your efforts and your materials and all that you have and you're putting all of your effort into those things and then you want God to still give you victory. But when God says get rid of it, whatever it is, when you refuse to do that, the results are not good. In Joshua chapter 9, Gibeah comes to Israel as Israel is in the process of taking control of the promised land that God has given to them. And Gibeah used old clothes and moldy provisions to convince Joshua and Israel that they were from a very, very distant land. They lied to them. The people of Gibeah said, when we left, all of this was fresh and new. And now look at it. The fact was, is that Gibeah was right in the middle of the promised land. And they were lying. The devil will make himself into an angel of light and try to convince you that it's actually God doing what the devil is doing. That, that's the oldest trick in the book that the devil has used. It amazes me when people say, God told me to, and it follows up with say this or do this. or The mercenary prophets of today, the, the phony prophets that are taking your money and your donations in order to exalt a false message. God told me this. And, and there's nothing of God in it. And, and so this is what, you, you know, we're coming to you from a distant land. We want to make peace with you. Once Israel found out what had happened, they make Gibeah their servants. Some people think that sin is serving them making them happy and giving them enjoyment in the long run. Always, 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 this is without re exception. You will always find out that sin is not serving you. You are serving it. In the long run, no matter what, and people can get very, very wealthy off of sin. People can have all kinds of provision off of sin. But you always find out in the end that even if you thought sin was serving you, it was you that was serving it. A little leaven leavens the entire lump. If you allow just a little bit of whatever into your life, it will not be long until that little bit is controlling everything. The old cliche, 
You give the devil an inch, he will take a mile. He never settles for the little bit that you think you are giving him. He will always take it all. And that's exactly what happened. Benjamin and Gibeah in Judges chapter 19. In the middle of Benjamin where Gibeah is left to settle in Israel. In the middle of Benjamin, the people of Benjamin, the men of Benjamin turn into evil, evil people. Gibeah is involved in this as the attitudes of Gibeah has saturated into Benjamin. And, and a Levite shows up and he's called into a man's house. And the men, men of the community people say oh the bible doesn't say anything about homosexuality yeah it does the men of the community show up at this man's house and demand that this man from levite comes out and they want to know him I i'm sorry i'll just tell you that means they want to have sex with him he ends up sending out his concubine that is with him and they molest her all night long until she ends up on the front step dead. I don't have time in this message to go through the entire story. The Levite ends up cutting this concubine into pieces and distributes it out into Israel. And Israel comes looking for him and they want to kill him for what he has done. And he says to them, this is what happened. So out of this issue, Gibeah, which should have been destroyed has caused a spread of sin into Benjamin. And Benjamin doesn't reject Gibeah now. Benjamin accepts and protects Gibeah, and they want to go to war with their brothers. Out of this story, 40,000 Israelites die. 25,000 men of Benjamin and Gibeah die. In the battles that follow it causes division in Israel because they did not get rid of what God told them to get rid of they made peace with it and it caused the near destruction of one of the tribes which was Benjamin in Judges 2 1 to 5 they repented that they had disobeyed God and they wept and they offered sacrifice, but they went right on with the sin dwelling in them. The disobedience was unchanged. They just wanted to offer sacrifices and have God accept them in that sacrifice. But don't ask us to change anything about what we are doing. Maybe that's why Samuel wrote in 1 Samuel 15, 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. You are being told by so-called ministries, if you'll just send in money, God will bless you. Give us a sacrifice and God will bless you. No, because to God, it's much more important that you obey him than it is that you offer sacrifice. Weeping and sobbing about the sin does nothing until you get rid of the sin. How loud have we been talking over the last several weeks? Sorry means nothing till you change what you are doing. The question becomes, are you sorry that you sinned or are you sorry that you got caught? Jesus was almost cruel in his approach to this attitude. Cut off your hand, pluck out your eye, whatever causes you to sin, get rid of it. God was cruel in saying, kill all of the inhabitants of the lands to the Israelites. No, he wasn't. He's saying, if you leave just a little bit, it will corrupt you. And it did. 
You see, it's an example that this attitude of saying, I can play with this in my life and I won't get burnt. Can I quote another cliche to you? When you play with fire, you always get burnt. And you can say, well, it's just a little thing. It's just a little thing. Oh, oh Mike, are you asking us to be perfect? I hope not because I'm not perfect. What I'm saying to you is that you cannot make peace with sin in your life. You cannot make peace with things that God has told you to get rid of. What fellowship does light have with darkness? You, you cannot coexist the, the famous bumper sticker of the day. Coexist with all of the symbols of different religions. You can't coexist when you begin to, ex to accept other things into your life. That's why Jesus said, even if it's your eye, even if it's your hand, cut it off because it won't stay in your eye and in your hand. It, it will infiltrate everything in your life. That's exactly what Gibeah did in the nation of Israel. Israel had ask and sought God about everything except for this situation where the people of Gibeah come to them and say, oh, we're from a far distant country and Israel made peace pact with them. We, we've got to realize that God wants to get rid of the leaven and change who we are. In Luke 17, the disciples ask Jesus, increase our faith. And Jesus says to them, if you had faith as the grain of a mustard seed, you could command the sycamine tree to be planted in the sea. How many trees have you uprooted in your life? How many trees that have been in your life that you know don't belong in your life? How many of them ha have you uprooted? As the grain of a mustard seed, I, I don't encourage you to go out because it's foolishness. And people that tell you to do this it is totally misinterpreting what the scripture says. Don't go out and start commanding trees to, to be tossed aside into the sea. But, but do you have any faith? Have you gotten rid of things that you know should not be in your life anymore? You know what they are. I don't have to tell you what they are. You don't have to tell me what they are. I know what they are and you know what they are. Why don't we get rid of them? Cast out those things that are hindering you that God has convicted you of and you still hold on to it. Do you have faith? That what he says he can do, he will do. May I say it, that sometimes it isn't that we can't get rid of it. Sometimes it's because we simply don't want to. We, we don't want to accept that God can change us. In fact, we don't want him to change us. We just want him to give us victory. The old thing that people get saved not because they want to change their lives. They just want fire insurance. They just want to make sure they're not going to go to hell. But they want to continue to live in this life the way that they want to live. Many in the Muslim world right now. Many in the Muslim world are having supernatural experiences and dreams. God is showing them Jesus Christ and they don't even know who Jesus Christ is. And in the dream, it's telling them, go seek this out or that out. And their lives are being changed. Why aren't we having those kinds of things happen? 
because we think if you have those kinds of dreams, you need some psychotic medication. It isn't signs and wonders that are evil. It's chasing after the signs and wonders that are evil. Jesus never said not to do signs and wonders. What he said was, is if you seek after signs and wonders, you're going to end up disappointed. But we have naturalized God in the Christian church. I've heard people trying to explain. I, I, I've heard people try to explain in the natural realm how the opening of the Red Sea happened and how the Israelite children walked across it. There has to be a natural explanation to it. I've even heard the silliness, and I've said this quite often, I've even heard the silliness that it wasn't the Red Sea, it was a sea of reeds, and the water was only about six inches deep. And I laughingly say, to people that's fine with me if you want the water to just be six inches deep that the Israelite children walked across that's fine with me you just choose what miracle you want to believe either God parted the Red Sea and let the Israelite children walk across it or God drowned the entire Egyptian army in six inches of water Every effort that you make to try to naturalize God, the silliness that Jesus knew where the rocks were, so when he was walking on the water, he was walking across on rocks. We've done everything that we can to naturalize God. Now, I'm not talking about the stupidity that goes on uh, around us in so-called ministry and so-called revivals. I'm not talking about barking like dogs and laughing like hyenas. What stupidity! Why would the Holy Spirit have any reason whatsoever to cause his people to do that? Just stupidity. I'm not talking about throwing your jacket at people and supposedly slaying thousands in the spirit by throwing your jacket at them. What absolute blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about sending in $333 of seed faith money and God will heal you and make you happy. If you're seeking after that stupidity, can I just say it to you really, really close? Quit it. But Jesus did signs and wonders and he told his disciples, greater things than these will you do and they did. It's seeking after the signs and wonders that are evil. We should seek after Jesus Christ and him alone. Let me say that to you again. We should seek after Jesus Christ and him alone. And if you need him to per perform for you, to believe that he is God, then you have a serious problem in your spiritual walk. If you need Jesus to do anything for you, to believe that he is God, you have a serious problem in your spiritual walk. Joshua 23, 10, one man of you shall chase a thousand for the Lord your God. He it is that fighteth for you as he hath promised you. So Mike, do you expect us to just step out on a promise? They said, where is the God of Elijah? Let me tell you where the God of Elijah is. The God of Elijah is waiting for the Elijahs of today to call on him with belief that he will do what he says, that he's capable of changing us. We don't have to dwell in sin. We don't have to accept the lies that the devil tells us. 
We don't have to accept the lies that Gibeah comes along and says in our lives. Oh, we want to be your friend. We want to get along with you. We want to have association with you. No, there's no such thing as a promiscuous Christian. There's no such thing as an idolatrous Christian. There's no such thing as a homosexual Christian. There's no such thing as an adulterous Christian. We are either a Christian or we are a sinner. Where is the God of Elijah? We need Elijahs that will stand up. That will smite the water. That will raise their staff. That will lay their mantle on the water. That will believe God. And greater things than this will you do. We have naturalized God. We have naturalized the church. Do you understand? The Bible tells us the gates of hell itself will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. Why is it prevailing? Not because it has power. Because we've just laid down. We've accepted the Gibeahs in our life. We're trying to win political elections instead of going into the prayer closet and saying, God, remove the sycamine trees from out of our way. I've preached it, I've yelled it, I've hollered it, and I know it doesn't do me any good, and I know this won't do me any good either. God gives us the power to cast out the strongholds and the imaginations and everything that exalts itself against God. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 4 to 6. But instead, we make peace with it and it becomes our Gibeah. We make peace with the imaginations and everything that exalts itself, the thoughts, the strongholds, all of those things. We make peace with it. We teach people in our seminars how to live in their despair and their destruction and their sin. We make peace with the Gibeah. And the same as that destroyed Israel almost wiped out the entire tribe of Benjamin. It's wiped out the church of Jesus Christ. The church of Jesus Christ as a whole, especially in America, is absolutely, get ready to get angry at me, the church of Jesus Christ, especially in America, is absolutely impotent. It has no power whatsoever. Because we have accepted sin. Not because we are tolerant of people or we love people or, or no matter what their struggle is, we continue to try to minister to them. Not any of that. We have accepted and endorsed what they are doing. We've put Gibeah right into our midst. And Gibeah has destroyed us. It, much like the Israelite people in the text, if we say we will serve God, then we must cut these things out of our lives. You cannot say, I will serve the Lord. And then say, I will serve sin. It is absolutely spiritually impossible. The Lord showed me this connection in this message as it plays out and Satan is at work in Israel trying to destroy Israel. Why was he so set on destroying Israel? He knew the Messiah was coming. So he did everything that he could to destroy Israel. He knows the Messiah is coming. And so he's doing everything that he can to destroy the church. 
He doesn't have the power to destroy the church. What he does have is the ability to get us to accept the sin into our midst and thereby destroy us. What is the Gibeah in your life? I know, as I said here behind this camera, I know, I know exactly what the Gibeah is in my life. Oh, you can go off and be Mr. or Mrs. Holy. You can tell me how perfect you are and how wonderful you are and you never do anything. You, you never struggle in your thought life. You never struggle in your physical life. You, you never struggle with any of your motives. You're, you just go ahead, tell me all of that. I'm not a hypocrite. I'm not trying to be a hypocrite today. But I'm telling you firsthand, if you allow Gibeah to continue to operate in your life, it's not serving you. You are serving it. And eventually, it will destroy you. God gave you power in your spiritual life, but that power is not going to come from who the president is. That power is going to come when you get in your prayer closet, when you humble yourself and pray and seek his face and turn from your wicked ways. He won't just heal your land as I have written before and many of you don't follow what we write. He won't just heal your land. We are his land. And he'll heal you. I want you to be healed. God wants you to be healed. But he says to us, don't make peace with these things in your life. Get rid of them. Get them out. Get them away from you. Dispose of them. Even if it's your right hand, cut it off. I'm not telling you to go out and cut off your hand. Neither was Jesus. He's giving you a point. No matter how valuable it seems to you, get rid of it because it's going to destroy you. What's the Gibeah in your life? Begin to deal with it harshly so that you can be everything that God wants you to be. Thank you for watching. I pray that you are blessed and I hope that you will continue to watch and read. Thank you.